There are many things in the Warframe universe that are interesting, but don't offer much in the way of depth. But the small, relatively inconsequential features of the Origin system are still very important in creating the full understanding of the Warframe universe. So, every few episodes I'll cover a few of these smaller topics to give them the attention they deserve. Additionally, new facts may arise that add more detail to, or directly contradict, my previous videos, and these episodes are a perfect way to address these changes. This is The Scattered Mix. The first topic is Darvo and his association with Bee Cloud. In one of the earlier episodes, I mentioned Alad and the emblem present on his medallion being that of the Bee Cloud hive mind. However, upon looking at Darvo's clothing, a similar medallion is present as well. This could mean a multitude of things. The first is that by wearing the Bee Cloud emblem, you are showing your ownership or membership of proxy units. Though Darvo is a Corpus Rebel, it's still possible he has purchased security proxies of his own, and the emblem serves as a sort of proof of purchase that could even distinguish him as a non-target for his proxies. Another theory is that the board is a part of, or even directly, the Bee Cloud itself. Not the robotic hive mind per se, but the central controlling entity behind the mysterious symbol. Therefore, high-ranking members or potential inductees could wear the symbol as a sign of their status, and Darvo keeps his simply because he does not care about it being present on his clothing, or because the emblem potentially offers him access to certain areas he would not normally have access to. A fatal mistake on the part of his father granting him the medallion before he rebelled. And of course, a much more cynical approach to the emblem is that it is simply reused assets for convenience's sake on the part of the devs, but that's much less fun. The next topic is the Corpus ships we see throughout the system. Obviously, a mercantile faction such as the Corpus would have use for ships of various classes, and we can see that reflected in their current armada. The names I use for the ships are my own, but follow the same theme of stone or building materials as the obelisk class ships seem to indicate. The first type of ship is the Ashlar, which are small, flat ships that we see hovering above ice planets. These ships are most likely used for low orbit or planetary surface transport, and are used for mainly collecting large resource deposits as evidenced by the containers along their sides. These ships most likely lack any major form of offense, and are exclusively used for production purposes. The next class are the Obelisks. These ships are named directly in-game, but it is unclear if it is a pet name for the ship or if it is an actual designation of their class. These ships are most clearly recognized by their enormous frontal segments which tower over the rest of the ship by a significant factor. Judging by the battle we see raging over Europa, the obelisks are likely the primary class of combat suited ships in the Corpus Armada, and their enormous bow serves as a sort of protection in frontal assaults. The third class is the Plinth class. These ships are recognizable by their large, forked frontal sections and their bundled rears dotted with multiple communication antenna. These ships, while smaller than the obelisks, most likely serve as medium-class assault ships to augment large-scale assaults, and also as heavily protected cargo ships, as their cargo hold seems to be clearly visible on the rear of the ship, boasting numerous container-like segments. The final major corpus ship class is the Cantilever. These ships are rarely seen, and are likely used exclusively for non-combat purposes such as large-scale cargo transport, or most notably, living quarters. The large tubular segments along the aft of the ship bear striking similarity to skyscrapers, and seem to be deliberately set apart from the main section of the ship. My theory is that these cylinders are used as large-scale civilian or non-combatant living quarters for extended stays in space, or even as a quick way to establish colonies on uncontested planetary surfaces. In my theory, when a potential spot for colonization has been cleared, the cantilevers proceed into low orbit and disengage one of these cylinders as it is guided by gravity tethers to the desired colony sector, and drops directly onto the surface, a quick and cost-effective way to dispense colonial control with relative ease. The next topic is Prisma Crystal and its formation within the Void. Clearly, Prisma Crystal is formed from the crystallized energies of direct void exposure, and due to the nature of Barrow Katir's work, he finds the opportunity to fashion these armaments often. The secret to creating these weapons may not be quite so obvious, as creating such a perfect, smooth crystallization could be outrageously difficult. Thus, these Void Expeditioners have likely perfected their craft through decades of practice and are subsequently the only ones who can offer these weapons. But even if the process was simple, other factions may have no use for Prisma weaponry to begin with. The process may not be cost effective, as simple weaponry can be produced much more quickly and efficiently, and it may not even have a noticeable effect when wielded by non-Tano. 
Due to the Tenno's synergy with the Void, they may be the only ones who can produce results from the Prisma weaponry, sort of like an extremely low-level channeling effect. Non-Tenno may even become poisoned by continued use of Prisma weaponry, so the desire for poisonous, highly expensive, non-traditional weaponry is extremely low outside of the Tenno themselves. The reason we do not see Prisma aboard the tower ships themselves may be due to their shielded nature. Though Void energies do seep in and affect the Corrupted, it is likely significantly less than the raw Void and may even be a different energy altogether after it has been filtered through the ship's defenses, which is why Argon Crystals form within towers but Prisma forms without. Another topic I purposely neglected in an earlier video was that of Grenier defectors. This was largely due to them not being Grenier by definition. Grenier refers to those under the rule of the Queens, and those who defect are simply clones who have abandoned the Grenier cause. As we learn in the Man of Few Words quest, defection is not only rare, but requires a specific genetic defect to occur. This indicates that due to the clone's history of being a subservient race, that their obedience is hardwired into their cloning templates, likely dating back all the way to the Orican era. Only through the leadership of other Grenier were they able to break free from their original genetic coding, perhaps indicating that if enough Grenier defectors band together, another uprising may occur. Unfortunately, due to the intense control of the Queens, surviving defectors are extremely rare and have little to no options for safe haven besides joining the Steel Meridian. One topic that many players notice but hasn't been acknowledged much in game is the terraforming done by the Orokin across the system. Though some planets are largely unchanged, many others have been drastically changed from the Orokin Empire's expansion. One notable example in game comes from the corrupted ancient synthesis entry where Lorist Ontella notes how the city of New Uxmal is as old as Mars' atmosphere, indicating that New Uxmal and many of the ancient structures on Mars and Phobos were the earliest settlements by the Orokin after the terraforming of the planet. The next topics are those brought up with the new Jordis boss fight. The boss fight introduces the fact that Technocyte is in fact capable of assimilating artificial intelligence as I had theorized in an earlier video, and also demonstrates the intelligence of the Hive and its desire to procure new tools that allow it to better assert its authority, in the case of Jordis, through the use of his voice. The fight also further hints that Warframes are made of inert Technocyte, calling attention to the fact that we are hollow shells and are of like flesh. This in turn adds credence to the Tenno as energy forms theory, and could be argued to support the single entity idea. The quest also adds a new topic of discussion to the Cephalons, showing us that there are a set of precepts Cephalons must follow in accordance with a set of rules that are either hardwired into each Cephalon by the programmers, or established by the Cephalons themselves, as they are capable of cooperation with one another, possibly indicating that there is a sort of council of Cephalons who dictate various behavior rules which are in turn established via the precepts. The next topic is the Yanis Key and its properties. In the Neural Sentry episode, user Chris W suggested that the Void Keys themselves are how we shield ourselves from the Neural Sentry, and that the Yanis Key is one that is coded to protect the user from all possible Neural Sentry configurations, which would make sense given its name. Perhaps there are multiple Yanis Keys that were once used by high-ranking Orokin to travel the towers at will, and Vor simply came into possession of one of the last ones, while us Tenno must use keys coded for only a single tower. And the final topic is just a brief theory, which I don't claim to be solid, on what the Umber are, given what we know so far. Though we have very, very little information, I theorize that the Umber are the Warframes who chose to stay within the first dream after the Orokin's fall. While many Tenno embarked to the second dream to relieve themselves of their troubling memories, others remained awake to either atone for their sins, or because they felt there were no sins to atone for. These frames chose to turn away from the honorable light of the Orokin, they extinguished the pure white light of the Empire forever and embraced this reality by turning to the shadow. The Umbra, the darkest part of a shadow, the place that is formed by standing directly behind the force that blocks the light. These Tenno display their guilt freely, perhaps even taking pride in the knowledge that they had a hand in ending the Empire forever. But as with many things in the Warframe universe, these are mostly uncertain and given what little information we have about these many things, they are definitely not the only interpretations. But until the time comes when we have all the facts, this is what we know.